Hey everyone, it's Dr. Rick, and today's tutorial is going to be on cholesterol and how to reduce cholesterol with exercise and nutrition. So I'm going to try to compress it into one video, but in case it goes over, I'll have to split it into two. If this is the first time you're finding me, though, don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below and the alert bell to find out when I do new videos. I usually release a few a week but because of the weight gain from COVID, the stress of possibly dying from COVID, and then the stagnant or sedentary life due to all the gyms being closed, we all gained weight. But unfortunately with that, the cholesterol and the diabetes issues also have blossomed. I think a lot of the primary care doctors and cardiologists are letting their patients know, you're now in high risk and we probably should reduce the risk as fast as possible not taking into account lifestyle change, which is always gonna be the first thing. I'm gonna to present to you a timeline of old school testing and newer age testing. The old school testing served people properly as far as throwing a big blanket out and trying to find who had elevated cholesterol. Assuming that elevated cholesterol or LDL always equaled heart attack. And as you and I both know, it doesn't always equal heart attack. But if you're trying to sweep the entire US population and bring down the events of heart attack, it's probably wise to tag everybody with risk factors and bring down all risk factors quickly. I mean, the only way to do that is usually medicines. But the problem is, which risk factors do we rely on? The old school techniques are to get a total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, and triglyceride level. And this is a standard approach. But I think there's problems with the standard approach because it tells you about LDL, but it doesn't tell you about what type of LDL. With the newer tests that have been available for about 15 years, you can actually fractionate and divide up all the LDLs. But if you review the Framingham study and other data points that have come out since then, there is an association between LDL and potential heart attack, but you really have to find what type of LDL. This test gets a general reading on total LDL, but it doesn't break it down. If you watch my video on Omega-3, oh, you see I reference the test results has printed by Quest Labs, but they also offer a pretty cool test in the form of the fractionated lipids. It's called Cardio IQ. And I'll see if I can put a link down below to Quest's website, but this is how it breaks it down. So you do have all the data from the old type of testing, and you also have newer data that breaks down into even further. It tells you about how many particles of LDL, and it tells you about the general size of those particles. Most importantly, I want to show you this. This is something called an LP little a and an apoprotein B level. Of all the LDL particles, the big ones that are buoyant and fluffy usually don't cause problems. It's the smaller ones, specifically LP little a, that usually have this little tiny tail. That's supposed to be a tail right there. But they have a little tiny tail that works as a trigger to oxidize everything. The bigger the LDL particle, the less the oxidation. The smaller the LDL particle, the more the danger. So we take the concept of LDL particles having a wide variety of size and we put it into the old measure. You can kind of see that there might be a relationship between total LDL and maybe heart disease. But if you have a large amount of LDL and they're all fluffy, you'll be automatically placed on an intensive therapy of statin medicines to bring down all the LDL, even if your LDLs that you have are safe. So in a nutshell, if you have large buoyant LDLs, you're probably safe. If you have small concentrated LDLs and a high LP little a, you're probably in danger. So anything that's greater than 30 really tells me who I have to pay attention to. In this patient, her LP little a of 37 makes me think, I gotta keep a close eye on her. But I would repeat again and follow her closely as far as lifestyle modifications. This is another example of a standard approach. And if you look at the total cholesterol of 227 and the LDL of 147, definitely elevated. The general suggestions are to bring down the LDL to 100. And if you have a high ASCVD risk, which I'll explain later on, of greater than 7.5%, then you really bring that down to 70. There, there are, are some, some patients that have a history of familial hypercholesterolemia. It's called FH. Doctors will bring that level down to like 30 to 50, which is ungodly. But the data says if you can get to that level, there will be no placking. The only problem is, are you going to have side effects from going that low? So the question is, who really needs intensive therapy? And I think if you have enough metrics, you can figure that out. In this patient who has high numbers by standard, if you look at the LP little a of less than 10, 
I wouldn't worry about this patient. We still have to worry about lifestyle modifications and continued risk factors, but if you look on that patient about whether she is high risk or low risk, further testing will give you guidance as well. If you look here, there's a positive ANA, and the ANA says that there's an inflammatory reaction going on, which again, puts that patient into a higher risk ASCVD score. Finally, one of my favorite tests as of the last two years is insulin level. I don't think my colleagues usually check this level, but I like to see an insulin level of three to four. And in this case, an insulin level of eight says that there's something going on with carbohydrates and a pre-diabetes state. So the standard approach for diagnosing insulin, which is another risk factor for heart attack, is to check a hemoglobin A1C and a fasting glucose, and that's just not enough. And some people will say, okay, you're safe because your numbers are good, but then they're obese, sedentary, smoking. I do believe that having an elevated insulin level is a trigger to have cholesterol become more sticky and easily oxidized. So in many cases, when my colleagues check for insulin resistance, They'll only do a fasting glucose and a hemoglobin A1C. And I think that's a little bit short-sighted because I've been checking those two numbers and even with obese or sedentary or smoking patients, they seem to be okay. And then if I check insulin levels in addition to those, bingo. And I find a lot of these patients with normal glucose and normal hemoglobin A1C will have a very elevated insulin, again, pointing to the fact that they are easily getting into a high risk category. So, Ask your doctor to check a fasting insulin and a fasting glucose, and if it's elevated greater than three to four, then you have high risk. I've been criticized by some of my colleagues for giving a lot of vitamins to my patients, but honestly, if you don't know what to do with vitamin deficiency, then you're probably gonna criticize me. If you do know what to do and how vitamin deficiency really pushes the metabolism to work poorly, then you'll see what I'm trying to do. I mentioned in the last video, which I put a link down below, that if your omega-3 oil is on the low side, that you're going to be in a pro-inflammatory state. Pro-inflammatory state is a stressed out state. It's almost like an infected COVID state. It's a heightened, anxious, waiting for abuse state. And sometimes when you live in those states, cholesterol will oxidize a lot easier. Work on the diet or just tell them the easy way around it is maintaining get. healthy diet and just adding omega-3 oil, which I believe helps LDL as well. My method is to check for deficiency first, try to adjust the diet, and if we're in a big hurry, adjust the diet, but also take supplement to speed things up. This is a typical example of a male, 57 years old, thinks that they're doing okay, kind of exercises every once in a while, doesn't have any symptoms. Here I checked omega-3 and this is high risk. So there isn't enough omega-3, there's way too much omega-6, this patient is pro-inflammatory. What's even more spooky in this patient too is that the numbers are elevated, like he was probably told before that his total cholesterol is definitely high, 230 and LDL of 151 has to be worked on. If he went to a cardiologist, he'd probably put him immediately on statins, which I think the suggestion was done a long time ago and the patient refused. Here's the risk though. Of all the LDL particles, he definitely has a lot of them. And the majority of them are small. And like I told you before, small, dense LDL particles penetrate through the lining of the blood vessels and begin the inflammatory reaction that causes the plaque formation. And look at his LP at little a, 130. I told you before, 30 makes me worried. 130 is just definitely a setup for a heart attack. In this case, I would nudge this person more into saying, listen, we got to do something. Even if you're not having any symptoms, this is impending doom. And he'll probably do okay, even if he was rushed to the emergency room, because they're stenting in most hospitals now. But the question is, if there's way too much disease, or if it's in an angle of a blood vessel where the cardiologist can't get a stent in, he's going to bypass. If he's on the fence with listening and maybe making some changes because he's too busy, I think the CAC or calcium CT scan of the heart is an easier metric for patients to comprehend more so than all the blood tests because you can see that if there's a picture of the heart, if there's a ton of calcium in every blood vessel of the heart, then we have a problem. And it's easy to fathom that calcium equals plaque, plaque equals heart attack. And I think and the arduous commitment to lifestyle, which includes exercise, nutrition, mindful practice, is easier to embrace. This is my final patient who already made some great lifestyle changes because he came in the first time with symptoms of diabetes. 
we found he had an elevated hemoglobin A1C that was easy. So the endocrinologist is giving him cholesterol medicines, diabetes medicines. And so but just to illustrate how important it is to get all these metrics to see value, his hemoglobin A1C, which was 11 when he was first diagnosed with diabetes, now it's 5.1, that's awesome. But if we only go with hemoglobin A1C and don't do insulin levels, we'll probably just say, you're good, keep on doing what you're doing. But I checked an insulin level and he's still elevated, meaning he has insulin resistance. So to me, if I can't get him down to a three or four from 13, I have to fine tune his lifestyle even further. His cholesterols are definitely elevated. 261 for a total cholesterol and 200 plus for an LDL. That's even worse than the other guy I just presented to you. And it makes sense that he should be put on a statin, which his doctor did place him on. But if I just left it at that, continued his medicines, dialed in his fine tuned lifestyle changes, then we would be missing this. This is that calcium score I was talking about. When I followed him up, because I just had a hunch there was something else going on, Followed him up with a calcium score. This is what I came up we with. We found multivessel disease and an extinct score of 333, which is very high, 90th percentile. Because the higher you go to 100%, the faster you have a heart attack. And we all knew that because he's diabetic and has elevated cholesterol. But here's the clincher. The other thing that the calcium score also reveals is calcium elsewhere. We did not know and wouldn't have found out that he had calcifications to the aorta, the aortic valve and the aorta itself. And this is dangerous. So he is on his way to get an echocardiogram to see how much valve damage he has. In the past, when I listened to his chest, there was no murmur. So I wouldn't have thought valve disease. But the thing with people who have elevated LP little a's, Usually that will also attack the valves. So when you have a high risk for a heart attack and you have valvular disease, so if we can get him early enough to control and reverse his disease even faster, we can keep him from hopefully having bypass or valve replacement. And I wouldn't have known that if I didn't continue on with the metrics that I always get. There is value in doing these tests, not only to just give you a whole bunch of vitamins, but also to fine tune and adjust who is at risk, who's not at risk, who do we pay more attention to? Who do we just say, ah, see me in a year? And this is where I'll get into the studies about what to do as far as implementing change. COVID has definitely caused a lot of deaths in the United States, and that seems to be a big picture every time you watch the news. But if you check out the CDC's website, you'll see last year, 655,000 people died of heart disease. And of those people that died, 365,000 plus were all from heart attack. You can see why cardiologists are still frustrated with the amount of heart disease, even if we have all these medicines, all these procedures, stent or bypass, and we're still having people die of the number one killer, heart attack. So something that we're doing in our wellness prevention is not working with regards to heart attack. But no question if the government's scrambling to try to decrease overall mortality, they'll try to target the number one reason, which is heart disease. And if you're asked as a cardiologist, how can we best serve the population by bringing down the worst disease in the U.S.? They're gonna say, give statins to everybody, put it in the water, give it to your baby formula, put it in bakery goods. But at this point in time, with cholesterol medicine being out there so long, heart disease is still number one. And you can argue it's because nobody's listening to the doctors as far as reverse the risk factors, or maybe they're not taking their statins. Or more importantly, maybe the frontline doctors, the primary care clinics, are not making the suggestion that's supposed to be made before giving any kind of medicines about lifestyle modification. Every algorithm, whether it's diabetes, high blood pressure, or cholesterol, always begins with lifestyle modification. And it's a little tiny blurb that you see in the algorithm, and then there's a whole bunch of information on the medicines. Unfortunately, most doctors don't have great training in exercise, nutrition, mindful practice. So if you don't have good training, you go straight to the medicines. And that's what I see as the problem in primary care. And there's no fault to my colleagues. We're just not given that didactic in school. And a lot of doctors can give referrals to dietitians, but I don't see that happening on a regular basis. Even the registered dietitian nowadays are so pressured with time constraints and limited reimbursement that they kind of skip over and just give everybody the same suggestions, which is not always right. You have to have a personal coach to design a personal program, whether it's a personal nutrition practice or a personal exercise routine but it has to be targeted to the patient that's in the room, not to the general population. So in summary, my favorite test is called a cardio IQ and that's available with Quest Diagnostics. You can also go to LabCorp, but they give a slightly different test result. It's an NMR lipid panel. And you'll have to ask for a separate LP little a test in addition to that. There's also the coronary atherosclerosis calcium score or CT scan calcium score of the heart. And for people who practice intermittent fasting, there is an insulin level and a beta hydroxybutyrate level that you can test 
to make sure that they are truly getting into ketosis. For those of you who have a very high deductible per year or don't have any insurance at all, you can actually order blood tests from walkinlabs.com. I'll put a link down below. You don't need a doctor's order and you can get results sent to you so you can discuss them with your doctor later on. The next part of my talk will be on what to do with regards to exercise to implement change. And I have a, a few patients who are really embracing walking or body weight resistance exercise. And I think that's fair, but honestly, walking, that should be, everybody does that. I don't care if you have medical problems, I don't care what age, everybody should be walking. So if you're embracing walking has the pinnacle of your exercise, you're lacking a bit. And, and it's no fault to you, but we have to develop more. So walking is entry level. Then there's walking with weight, then there's sprinting or jogging, then there's cardiovascular exercise, then there's resistance on top of that. I think that's the pinnacle that I would climb. And everybody's a little different with regards to their injuries, their knowledge base, who can teach them or who can coach them. But the power in exercise is making the right choices that will effectively change the LDL levels. I'll throw up a couple of these studies so you can reference them. This is an RCT, which is the gold standard for testing, and it's on resistance exercise and LDL lower. This is a study on premenopausal women just for 14 weeks. This is on postmenopausal women and resistance exercise. This is a newer study from 2019 that associated HDL with resistance exercise. The problem now is that HDL has been associated with exercise, but increasing HDL doesn't necessarily decrease the chance of heart attack. This is a nice paper that talks about LP little a as a very important metric for determining who's at risk. And my last two studies talk about exercise in general for lowering heart attack risk. You can just freeze and look those two up, but it talked about how aerobic capacity exercise can play around with triglycerides and HDL, but how resistance exercise lowers LDL. So for those of you who love cardio and you don't like resistance, I would highly suggest we get you a coach to develop a resistance program that you love. Just because I say resistance doesn't mean you have to get into powerlifting or get big bulky muscle. It's, it's just, just adding another lifestyle change that you can rely on that has proven itself to be helpful in reversing disease. So if you have elevated cholesterol and your doctor has been pushing you to get on statins to lower your risk for heart attack and you're resistant, at least ask for the other tests. And if you don't get the doctors to order those tests, you can always consult me online and I can order them. Whether they're paid for or not, I'm not sure. But as I mentioned before, walk-in labs is pretty cheap. So if you're one of those folks with elevated cholesterol, it'd be important to have as many metrics as possible to make a decision about whether you're gonna be pulling the trigger on lowering fast with medicines or taking your time and making those lifestyle changes. But either way, you always have to have lifestyle change, which is exercise, nutrition, mindful practice, weight loss, as part of your formula for reversing disease, living life, and without disability. So hopefully this helps you with a couple of ideas about why I like to push hard with regards to lifestyle change and who I push harder with and who I don't. Don't forget to give a thumbs up if this helped and share it with other people who are on the fence. Otherwise, I'll see you at the next video.